Hello everyone, I'm Brian Reel and I am an assistant professor of information and library science at Southern Connecticut State University. I'm one of several co-organizers for this conference. The others are Oliver Geiken of the University of Maryland, Martin Johnson of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Audrey Amadon and Heidi Holmstrom of the National Archives and Records Administration. We've been helped along the way by additional staff members of the National Archives, some of whom are taking a visible part in the conference, and others who have remained behind the scenes. This conference would not have been possible without the tremendous institutional support we have received from both the National Archives and the University of Maryland. Several of us who are involved in this conference are members of the Association of Moving Image Archivists also known as EMEA, and a major part of that organization's conferences is its archival screening night. After all, if you spend a few days talking about how to do the work of motion picture archiving and preservation, it's nice to actually see some of the archive's holdings. While this served as a model for us, EMEA's archival screening night is usually something of a grab bag from different archives, while for this evening, we are primarily focused on the holdings of the National Archives. Audrey, Heidi, and I picked a few things just because we thought they were cool, but for the most part, we let our conference participants offer feedback and guide our selection process. Heidi will speak more on that in a moment. We are showing extended clips for the most part to allow our program to have a bit more variety. We are extremely grateful for Dennis Doros and Amy Heller of Milestone Film and Video for hosting this screening for us through their Vimeo account and especially for their steadfast work in supporting film and media archivists over the years. As you watch these films, please remember that they are available because of the work done by archivists. This is a team effort that goes beyond just film and media archivists. Without the work of archivists to arrange, describe, and provide access to paper records and other documents, we would not have the information needed to contextualize and understand many of the films we are showing this evening and that our presenters will discuss during the conference. And with that, I will turn things over to Heidi. Thank you, Brian. My name is Heidi Holmstrom, and I'm a film preservationist in the National Archives Motion Picture Preservation Lab. Films made by the U.S. government were intended to document educate, and persuade, and we will be showing you selections from many films tonight to illustrate these different types. I worked with Brian and Audrey Amidon, also from the Motion Picture Preservation Lab, to choose films that help illustrate the themes of the Films of State Conference. You will see films about the U.S. government's relationship to the land, the activities of the military, and the government's communications with people, both at home and abroad. Special thanks go to Andrew Simpson, Bert Bloom, Lindsay Zarwell, Hadi Garabaki, Yunju Strumpfels, and Dongyun Kim for helping us to enhance your viewing experience tonight. We are going to open the screening with Land of the Lofty Mountains, a silent park service film that has been given a wonderful new score by pianist Andrew Simpson. And with that, let's roll the film.
What if Noah's Ark had leaked? All animals man your station! Yet a lot of people live in houses that leak valuable energy. If your house leaks heat in winter or loses its cool in summer, install adequate insulation and you'll be more comfortable and save valuable energy dollars. Apply weather stripping, storm windows, and storm doors. Then caulk all cracks and small holes. Energy-saving home improvements can eventually pay for themselves in lowered fuel bills. You'll also help save our energy sources. If you don't have the cash, you may qualify for a HUD-insured Title I home improvement loan. Write HUD Energy Saver, Washington, D.C., 20410. It was early morning in Georgia. Long before daybreak, in a lone house at the edge of the forest, a boy lay awake with excitement, for this was to be an important day in his life. He had hardly slept the night before, but not his brother, Harry. In all fairness, you couldn't blame Harry. For him, it was just another day of work. But for the boy, it was the first day of his vacation from school, and he was going to make the most of it. father was still asleep, and he took care not to wake him. In the kitchen, his mother was making breakfast, and it would soon be ready. Though the boy and his family lived on a small farm, they were people of the forest. His father and brother made their living with the stroke of the axe and the pull of the saw. And today, for the first time, the boy was to work at their side in the forest. People often say, you're as old as you feel. Well, that day, the boy felt like a man, and he was ready and anxious to prove it. to the boy, having wonderful people for a family. His mother, Mamie, a gentle woman who gave loving care to her family. His father, Louis, a kind man who was as wise as he was strong. And his brother, Harry, who worked hard and said little.
together, they were the Hunter family. For over 80 years, the Hunter family has owned this farm. The boy's grandfather and his father before him cleared this land and planted cotton and tobacco. But ever since James's father was old enough to lift an axe, he had been a woodsman, cutting and hauling logs. His tools were the simple tools of the forest, the axe and the two-handled saw. I can remember when this was clear. Looks like some dirty birds were here. Looks like somebody dumped oil into the stream. Someone threw paper cups into it, too. And soda pop cans. Why do people do this, Woodsy? Well, Greg, they just don't think. They forget to be careful. But that's how we can help. Now, if we see a mess, help clean it up. But most important, don't make a mess in the first place. <laughs> Come on, kids, let's get busy. Help Woodsy spread the word. Never be a dirty bird. No matter where you go, you can let some people know. Do give a hoot, don't pollute. Never be a dirty bird. In the snow or on the sand, help keep America looking grand. Oh, help Woodsy spread the word. Never be a dirty bird. No matter where you go, you can let some people know to give a hoot, don't pollute. Never be a dirty bird. In the city or in the woods, help keep America looking good. Hello, boys and girls. I have a special message for you from the President of the United States. Let me read it to you. I salute the boys and girls who are buying United States savings stamps and bonds through the Treasury School Savings Program. They're learning the lessons of practical citizenship and of wise money management. And they're giving important support to the cause of freedom and the men who fight for us in Vietnam. That message is on this wallet size U.S. savings bonds pledge card, which you'll get in school as soon as you begin to buy U.S. savings stamps. Let's get started today. What do you say?
Today you can safely say that a tactical map is also an army film distribution map, stretching for countless miles in every direction. But this is only the beginning. From here on, the films and equipment must be moved to the interior, must be moved by whatever modes of transportation are available, and those that can be improvised. Naturally, much is contingent on the risk and terrain, but it can be said that wherever supplies are moved, by what means they are moved, so the films are carried right up to the threshold of battle. In the skies over the battle-scarred Southwest Pacific area, Film containers are part of the cargo en route from New Caledonia to a strategic island outpost. Below is Bougainville. Similar landings are made throughout the Solomon Islands and surrounding areas where our hard-fighting troops are making it hot for the Jap. The welcome passengers begin the last leg of their journey, moving right up with the mail bags. Letters from home and movies tonight at the Bougainville Roxy. Films are greeted like long-lost friends. Weary but eager warriors converge on their little theater as the word races through camp. A brief lull means that some of the men can see the new show while others keep up the jungle watch. The names of these island battlegrounds are familiar to all who follow the war in the Pacific. Yet how many know that men starve for entertainment are carving their own makeshift theaters out of a tangled wilderness? These scenes and all that follow were photographed by combat camera crews. This is the real McCoy, spot coverage that breathes realism into all that has been written about the average GI and his craving for motion pictures. Wire reels for seats, coconut logs for seats in a palm grove selected for added atmosphere. They even line up all the empty gas barrels in sight. Anything that can be sat on. Ingenuity born of necessity, and their arrangement makes good sense, right up to the placement of the projection booth. Sometimes rear echelons can go in for fancier and more permanent structures. This is the best in the area. But fancier otherwise, the same results are produced. Countless thousands of war miles, millions of troops, heterogeneous in other respects, yet maintaining a mutual interest in screen entertainment. This is the story of a young man who discovered his true calling in the war-torn skies of Europe. Wilbur Bloom of Oxford, Ohio, volunteered for the U.S. Army Air Corps in 1943. After completing flight school, he was assigned as a bomber deer on the B-25 medium bomber. In March 1944, he arrived in recently liberated Corsica, home of the 340th Bomber Group and was soon flying his first combat missions. One of the most remarkable things about the Second World War was the degree to which it was documented on film. Many Hollywood directors and cameramen had volunteered for service. In addition, hundreds of young men with an aptitude for photography and cinema were identified and pulled together to form combat camera units. They operated in every theater of the war. Lieutenant Bloom, a camera enthusiast, was transferred to the newly formed 9th Combat Camera Unit in June 1944. He got his hands on IMO and Mitchell cameras and began making movies. That summer, the commanding officer of the 340th assigned him to produce a short documentary that would be called Training During Combat. The objective was to show how continued training in forward combat zones contributed to the group's success. I was keen to see this example of my father's early work. I also had reason to believe that the film contained unseen wartime footage of another young bombardier, Joseph Heller, 
who gained fame two decades later as the author of Catch-22. In 2014, my search led me to Nara. To my surprise, they rapidly located nine reels of unedited footage from training during combat that was shot by Lieutenant Bloom. The combined running time of this footage is nearly 73 minutes. Of this, over eight minutes contain scenes showing Joseph Heller in uniform. It is unclear whether the film was ever completed. What you see here is an edit that the NARA team made based loosely on the script. A C-47 has just pulled up on the landing strip. An eager replacement crew piles out of the plane. Young Joseph Heller, playing a new bomber deer, is the second man down the steps. Excited and a little cocky, the guys throw their baggage into an open truck and drive off to the operations building. New crew gape at veteran airmen returning from a mission. The next moment, they encounter the group commander who welcomes them. A wacky grin breaks across Heller's face as he shakes the commander's hand. The men are eager for action, but they can save their bravado for later. The colonel has recommended a regimen of lectures and training sessions. The gunners work out on trainers armed with dummy machine guns that squirt pressurized water at moving model planes. This one simulates combat for a ball turret gunner. The pilot and bomber deer practice their coordination for bomb runs, crawling over a cement floor aboard a special training device. Here you can see Joe Heller operating the top secret Norden bomb site. Between missions, the pilot sharpens his skills on the link trainer. Inside this dark gyrating capsule, he flies on instruments alone. This gunner is getting more practice on the tail gun trainer, so he can shoot enemies attacking from the rear. Emblazoned on the device is the squadron emblem. In case of a hydraulic system failure, crews can lower the landing gear using a manual crank. In this scene, enlisted men and officers use a wrecked B-25 as a demonstration model. Concentric steel hoops define fire zones for topside gunners. These are some of the finest shots of young Joseph Heller in the film. They depict the new bombardier's visit to the squadron navigator for a few pointers. It was an important relationship because the bombardier had to do most of his own navigation during the bomb run. For targets that were especially difficult to identify on the final approach, 
models were built to study the features of the terrain. The time has come for the new men to put their skills to the test. All the crews listen intently as officers conduct the briefing. The new crew huddles for a final confirmation of the plan before loading their bombs. They're ready to go. The pilot fires up the engines and taxis to the end of the runway, lining up with the other ships from the squadron. its twin engines the plane picks up speed take off once airborne the pilot joins three other b-25s in a box formation in the plexiglass nose the bombardier looks out the window and confirms the target Bombs away. Today is just a final test. The target, an uninhabited rock in the sea. The bombers peel off for home, their crews confident and well prepared for combat. The brief and exciting year with the 9th Combat Camera Unit was a springboard for Wilbur Bloom's career. Returning to civilian life, he enrolled in the graduate program at the University of Southern California Cinema Department. Upon graduation, he joined the faculty at USC Cinema, where he taught for 10 years. His first major triumph came in 1956, when his short film, The Face of Lincoln, was awarded an Oscar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Bloom produced films for the U.S. Air Force during the 1960s, working out of Lookout Mountain Air Force Station, a secret production facility in the Hollywood Hills. Projects included a series of people-to-people -people films for the Pacific Command. In 1973, he joined the USIA as production manager of the motion picture and TV service. He enjoyed the frequent collaboration with overseas filmmakers, actors, and writers. In the final phase of his government career, Wilbur T. Bloom was director of motion picture and television policy at the Department of State. He retired from the Foreign Service in 1981. In his later years, he taught public policy and communication at the United States International University in San Diego. He had seen a lot of the world, influenced students, filmmakers, and public diplomacy, and made many, many friends.
You play. Uh huh. Oh, Jesus, you're slow. Oh, shut up. I said it was your play. Okay, okay. Here, how's this? What a jerk. Dr. Bush wants to see you, Lucas. Oh, for Christ's sake. Now, what'd you do? Okay. Good luck. Come in. This is Lucas, sir. Sit down, Lucas. Thank you, sir. Cigarette? No, sir. You know, Lucas, I've been wondering about you. During the week that you've been here, I've noticed that, unlike the other men, you don't talk in our group session. What is it to talk about, sir? Lots. You hear the other men getting quite a few things off their chest. You should be able to see that they feel better by so doing. What ship were you on, Lucas? The Montandon, sir. The Montandon was sunk, wasn't she? Yes, sir. Last May, south of Mindanao on a high sea. Torpedo aft. And you were a fireman? I am, sir. Certainly. And it's a tough job being a fireman. Always below decks, you never see what goes on. That's why I'm fed up. Nobody gets it. Nobody. Maybe not. And yet there may be some of us, even among those of us who haven't been there, who do understand. What do you, sir, know about what it feels like to be a fireman? What does anybody know what it feels like to be a fireman except a fireman? You gotta be there to know. You gotta feel that goddamn heat. On well, the Montana, it was always 128 degrees below decks. 128 degrees of sweat and more sweat. No place to go or to move to. It was 
guys topside have it soft. They can breathe air, move around, see the enemy. Hell, we don't know whether the next minute will bring a bomb or whether there's a torpedo coming for us right now. What was your job in the engine room, Lucas? I was striking for water tender. I watched the lines feeding water to the boilers. That's why I couldn't move. I had to stay with those goddamn valves. The guys topside can take it out in the enemy. They can shoot a gun. All I could do was wish I could twist a valve, but I couldn't because I'd wreck the boiler. Christ, you get so you gotta do something and well, all you end up with is a burning feeling in your guts and your hands shaking. God damn it, look at me. This isn't me, Doctor. How did you feel, Lucas, when you knew you were safe in the water? How did I feel? Yes. I was damn glad to get out of that hole. Anybody would have been. No, Lucas, not everybody would have been. That's something you've got to face. Furthermore, you didn't really find relief, did you? I said I was glad to get out of that hole. Perhaps for a while. But I doubt it for long. How about it, Lucas? How about it? No, I got the feeling I let my buddies down. And that's it, Lucas. And that's something you've got in a way to feel proud of. You were in a tight, tense situation. And quite naturally, you were afraid. You and every other man on that ship. Your buddies in the engine room, the gunners topside, you were all afraid. Because that's what happens to men in a battle. You were no different from any other man on that ship. Only most of them accepted their fear. You fought against yours. If I only could have been topside, if I could only have moved around. It would have made no difference. You see, you let your fear get control of you. You wanted to get out of the engine room. That's why you felt relieved when you were in the water. Even though you'd been blown from the engine room, as far as you were concerned, you had escaped. In your mind, you felt that you'd deserted your buddies, your ship. As a result, you feel guilty. Yes, sir. That's a feeling that you have to face and conquer. And the only way you can do that is to understand that the real cause of your being here is your normal fear in time of battle. Fear which you didn't learn to handle properly. That you're continuously short-tempered, even mean, that your hands shake, you have a burning sensation in the pit of your stomach, all stem from this cause. Now, in order to start getting well, you have to realize this. And in realizing it, remember that fear and the thoughts that it makes you think at the time are normal, nothing to be ashamed of, shared by all of the other men who were with you on the Mount Handen as well as by the men on all ships. A ticking bomb means trouble for Batman and Robin. Holy breaking and entering! It's Batgirl! Quick, Batgirl, untie us before it's too late. It's already too late. I've worked for you a long time and I'm paid less than Robin. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. No time for jokes, Batgirl. It's no joke. It's the federal equal pay law. Holy act of Congress! If you're not getting equal pay, contact the Wage and Hour Division, U.S. Department of Labor. As we approach the 21st century, there is much to learn about our world and ourselves. This learning occurs best in a climate of equal opportunity. In that sunny climate, human intelligence, trust, and total commitment can prosper. We become the winning team. For uh, purposes of testing equipment, and we no longer had a need for that, we gave that up about three years ago. But that is where the water immersion facility will be built. I would like to go into space for a couple of reasons. Uh, the space program meets my particular academic needs, gives me something that's intellectually challenging, also physically challenging, but much more important, I think, that man needs something to dream about. Uh, we've explored our world far fairly thoroughly. I realize that the ocean's remaining, that there's the net three quarters of our world, but there's really just two frontiers left, the ocean and space, and I'd like to be part of that effort. I certainly feel that women are, are here to stay as part of the space program. Um, you know, this time all the women selected were selected as mission specialists, 
Uh, I certainly feel that in future selections with women training as pilots that there will be uh, women selected as pilots. Um, I think we're here to stay. Who is to say who will succeed or fail in any task we Earthlings undertake? For is there really any difference between the minds of males and females? The women of NASA don't think so, and neither does NASA. For it is generally agreed that differences in performance occur when there is a difference in opportunity to learn and to gain experience. When I was picked about a year or so ago to be um, a backup payload specialist on a, on a dress rehearsal of a space shuttle flight, I was, I was afraid at that time because I thought, well, maybe, maybe I really can't do it. But as it turned out, uh, I was picked because of the investigators who had submitted experiments, just as it'll be for an actual flight. Um, the, the payload specialists, the scientists, astronauts, are chosen because maybe there's some particular characteristic of their own experiments that would make them themselves be the, the best person to conduct that experiment, and also because their background, their educational background, is varied enough to be able to adequately uh, carry out other people's experiments on board. And as we went through the uh, simulation, I found out that I, I could learn what I had to learn, and that I was doing just fine. Fire. approach the 21st century, drifting through the universe at almost a thousand miles per minute, increasingly we are coming to realize that equal opportunity, intelligence, excellence, and teamwork, rather than race, creed, color, or sex, are the keys to success in space travel. Whether we happen to be aboard a space shuttle or on board our mothership, Social security isn't just for old folks when they retire, no sir. 
Send them back. The man says this ain't for old folks. Well, no, it isn't just for old folks, but they can listen if they want to. You see, Social Security has something for everybody. It has benefits for when you retire. Well, those are the benefits everybody knows about. But it also has important benefits for young people, too. Benefits that could come to you if something happens to your father or to your mother. Benefits that could help keep you in school. That does it. I'm leaving. Hey, let the owl talk. Just stay with me, folks. This film also has information that's important to know when you're working. Say, that little girl in red in the back, she's awful cute. But how are you going to take care of her if something happens to you and you can't work? I don't know. I guess somebody will have to go out and get a second job. I guess. Well, like I said, why don't you listen to this film? Because Social Security has something for everybody, and this film will show you just what I mean. Are you ready? Roll them! Woo! One of the best sounds around was the People Crackers Plant Number no. 5 Marching Band and Groove Society. Hal Hippo blew first sousaphone. And Robert Rabbit hit lead glockenspiel. They were really fine days. The band was doing gigs all over the town, and Hal and Robert were kept busy every weekend. During the week, they were kept busy at the world's largest maker of people crackers, a big favorite of all the animals. But when they weren't working, they always found time for fun. The good times did roll, and the hippos and rabbits enjoyed the good life all the way. And then, one fateful day, it happened. Harry and Robert were working a big Independence Day celebration with all the works. tragedy. Poor Hal Hippo, gone almost a month now, and Robert Rabbit still unable to walk. The doctor still thinks it might be as much as two more years before Rabbit is back to normal health. Mrs. Rabbit is worried because they're using their savings for day-to-day -day expenses. Then, one fateful day... This is where I come in again. <laughs> Excuse me, folks, you mind if I come in? Uh, Mr. Walrus, the funeral director, and Mr. Raff, the teacher down at the school, well, they told me about your problems. Mr. Raff was very worried because she hasn't seen the children for some time. Normally, people come to us about their benefits, but I think your case is special. I'm from Social Security. But I'm not retiring. Oh, quite right. But Social Security isn't just for retirement. It protects your family at any age. For example, why aren't the children in school? They're all looking for part-time jobs. Because Robert isn't going to be able to work for at least two years, and our savings won't carry us that long. They should still be going to school. Who would work then? Mrs. Rabbit and I have the little ones to take care of, and we have to eat and pay that rent. That's why I'm here. Both Hal and Robert had Social Security at the plant, didn't they? Sure, for retirement. Ah, uh, you forget now. I said there are other Social Security benefits.
هفت نفر دانشجوی ایرانی که از میان 310 نفر داوطلب در امتحانات حائز بهترین رتبه گردیده بودند هفته گذشته به خرج دولت امریکا به منظور ادامه تحصیلات عالی خود آزم نیویورک شدند این عده که فارغ و تحصیل دانشکده های مختلف ایران هستند برای مدت یک سال در یکی از دانشگاه های امریکا که خود انتخاب نمودند رشته های تخصصی خود را تکمیل خواهند کرد تا با کسب معلومات و تجربیات بیشتری در مراجعت به میهن منشع خدمات موثرتر و مفیدتری باشند شب عید نوروز 22 نفر از ایرانیان زندانی بازگشته از شوردی که به تدریج به میهن خود باز می‌گردند آزاد شدند. این 22 نفر نمونه هزاران ایرانی زحمت کشند که اغلبشان در انفوان جوانی به زور به خاک شوردی کشانده شده بهترین دوران عمر خود را در آنجا با زندان و شکنجه و اعمال شاقه به سر بردند. اکنون دولت شاهنشاهی ایران برای ایرانیان بازگشته از شوروی خانه زندگی و کسب و کار در میان کس و کارشان در محل و مولدشان فراهم ساخته است. امید از سایر ایرانیان مصیبت دیده نیز بتوانند به زودی به خاک میهن بازگشته از نعمت سلامت، آزادی و امنیت برخوردار شوند. از منبیات علا حضرت همایون شاهنشاه وزارت فرهنگ سعی می کند دانش آموزان علاوه بر کسب مطالب نظری از کتاب عملا نیز با دانشی که می آموزند آشنا شوند از این رو با راه نمایی های آقای دکتر مهران وزیر فرهنگ اخیرا تحت نظر آقای گرجی مدیر کل فرهنگ استان تهران به امور فنی و حرفه‌ای در مدارس پایتخت و همه توجه بیشتری مبذول می گردد. امروز بالغ بر دویست و شست هزار نو آموز و هشتاد هزار دانش آموز در دبیرستان ها و دبستان های استان تهران با روش علمی نوین که بر پایه متد امریکایی استوار است مشغول تحصیل هستند. در سال تحصیلی آینده دبیرستان های دولتی جدیدی که فرهنگ استان تهران تأسیس می کند فقط دبیرستان های هرفی و فنی خواهد بود. هنر و تفریح نیز در برنامه آموزشی مدارس مورد توجه کامل قرار دارد. سال تحصیلی 1338 و 1339 در شرف پایان است. در پایتخت و شهرستان ها هزاران کودکستان، دبستان و دبیرستان از شاگردان امتحان به عمل آورده یکی پس از دیگری تعطیل می شوند. بکس بچه ها در اکادمی نیروی دریایی آمریکا فرزندان افسران و افراد برای بکس بازی وزن می شوند. دوتا جوجو خروس وزن آرتیس بازی رو شروع میکنن دستکش های نرم بزرگ دست کردن تا دک و دندشون خورد نشه بیچاره پدرها دل در سینه شون میتپه جنگ مغلوب است بزن جانمی ماشالله بابا مطلش نکن این بچه منده ها از حالا آتشی و جنگی هستند وای به حال بعده ها این شیر بچه ها در آینده جانشین پدرها شده و کشتی های از این را در اقیانس های بیکران رهبری خواهند کرد دسته گلدن گیت کوارتت آمریکا در تهران برای سرگرمی شما
واریتی هنری انجمن ایران و امریکا که چندی قبل در تهران به معرض نمایش گذارده شد چنان مورد استقبال قرار گرفت که بنا به تقاضای عده کثیری دوباره بر روی صحنه آمد اخبار ایران اکنون قسمت های دیگر این واریته را برای تماشاچیان عزیز خود نمایش می دهد کورتت کور انجمن ایران و امریکا به رهبری ایرج گلسرخی و شرکت افسانه خدابند لو مینو گلسرخی ایرج ربیعی و حسن عادلی یکی از آهنگ های محلی ایران را اجرا می کنند خانم جین فرمان فرمایان قطعی به نام محتاب از ساخته های دبوسی آهنگساز معروف فرانسوی را اجرا می کند این هم یک آهنگ معروف امریکایی که توسط دیک کلارک فرزند یکی از مستشاران امریکایی مقیم تهران به وسیله ساز دهنی اجرا می شود با اجرای یک قطع ضربی به وسیله آقای حسین همدانیان نوازنده معروف برنامه واریته هنری انجمن ایران و امریکا به پایان می رسد گفتن گفتن به بوتی ساده که همچین همچین گفتا گفتا نشود مگر به همچین همچین
대회는 2위를 차지해서 세계 무대 오를 미국 선수로 선발됐습니다. 인기를 득했습니다. 이 젊은 선수들의 앞날이 잠옷 기대됩니다. 
After five years, the students become teachers in small villages, rural areas. They use their knowledge to awaken interest in the community and new farm techniques, instructing children in modern farm practices and the adults in the solutions to their particular problems. 